Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I am Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. And today we are talking about the sexless marriage. Um, there are a lot of ways for that to go, but we're going to talk about it from a very personal perspective. Um, we both have experience being in um, uncomfortably sexless parts yeah. of marriages. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to have a discussion about how that has felt for us. And I'm going to hand this over to you because when I brought this topic up and said, a bunch of people have asked us about to talk about a sexless marriage. How do you feel about talking about it? You were like, uh, great. <laughs> this is yeah. not your favorite topic. No, it but isn't. I appreciate that you're willing to, to, to face it and to be honest about how it went for you. So I think that uh, first off, I want to say that I have I've heard particularly recently quite a few stories of people who are intentionally um, having sex, sexless marriage, like sex is not part of our marriage relationship and, or and any long term relationship, this marriage. Is, yeah, yeah. Wh whatever it is um, uh, that uh, I'm not going to speak to that specifically because that's a completely different experience than what so, I'm talking about. Yeah. What you're talking about there, as I understand it from the perspective of a sex educator, is a an agreed upon, thoughtful and. Um, Disgust happy, and happy, 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 sexless right. marriage, or and that might be just a happy sexless marriage. Whereas in those two people don't have sex. Perhaps they have sex with themselves. They may engage in solo sex. They may engage in um, sex that's with other partners. So we're not talking about that in this no. particular what? episode. We when... will talk about that. We're going to talk about that in an episode concerning. Um, a, alternative relationship structures mm -hmm. that are specifically designed to be not focused on or not including sex. And we will also separate out the topic of asexuality. So let's just be really clear up front. Low desire is not a pathology. In fact, I don't even know what the word low desire means because yeah. there is no standard I've there is no correct amount of desire. Nor is there any useful metric so, for measuring it. Right. Okay. So, so yeah. flat out, there is no normal <laughs> amount thing. of sex to want or to have. There is no normal amount of desire to want or to have. So let's just dispense with that notion immediately before we get into this discussion. Yes. Because any idea that there is some, some preset standard that we should measure against yeah. is going to actually take away from the conversation yeah. about what it feels like to be in a relationship where you're not having sex and you don't really know why. Yeah. So, so you, you asked me if I would talk about this and I, it's okay. This, this is worth talking about. Absolutely. And it became immediately clear to me as I started thinking about it, that this is all I statements. Every single thing I'm about to say is about me. And that's that's all I can talk to. And so it starts off with, um, I didn't like how much sex I had in my first marriage. I wanted to have more sex than I was having. Like data. That's just my, my experience of it. Um, and then we come to the more uncomfortable part of it, which is that I didn't do anything about that. I didn't even talk about it. I didn't bring it up and say, oh, hey, by the way, I'm not getting what I want. I never said that. That's wild. Right? I When you say you never said that, let's give some time frames here. How long were you married altogether? How long were you with this person? Um, the 20 years? actual marriage is like 18 and a half or something like that. Not quite. So 20 you were years. together for yeah. 20 years. Yeah. 
and, and then the time before and then that's from the, the the date of the wedding so with this person for more than 20 yeah. years okay and you're talking about how much of that 20 years um i guess probably a good um half of it where i felt like i wasn't getting what i wanted i would say that the last 10 years anyway mm -hmm. um and then there was a period where um, it just it, it wasn't something we did. We didn't have sex. So there were times during this relationship where you were having less sex than you wanted to. Yep. And not doing anything. You weren't you weren't intentionally trying to change that right. in any meaningful way. I was as not. I hear it. Mm -hmm. And then there was a period of time where you were having no sex at all. Yeah. In, in no partnered sex yep. at all. And still not doing anything to try to change it. Okay. So I think we have to touch on the fact that there's an, a much earlier episode where we talk about what is sex. Mm -hmm. So for the purposes of, of that particular relationship container, that marriage, what did you think of as sex back then? I don't mean what you think of sex now. Well, I definitely thought of you sex. You were married to a, a vulva owner. I was. You were married yep. to, um, and... who identified as a woman. Mm -hmm. You identified as uh, a man, yep. a penis owner. Mm -hmm. What did you think of as sex? I thought of it as um, penis and vagina sex, generally speaking. Um, that was the did core of it. Did oral sex Count the oral sex you? oral sex counted yes it did anal sex count um it would have okay so you i'm hearing in there like that there's some recognition that that there was a pretty narrow definition of what sex was right so we would i mean i would rub her shoulders you know either i'd give her massages and things so like that touching. so it was touching it wasn't um it wasn't like a touchless car wash it was there was there was touching um that image is gonna stick <laughs> yeah just kind of go through on a conveyor belt um but in the narrow definition of sex that i just gave you um it was very 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 little to start off and um, periods of time there was none and those periods of time lasted on the order of years though right yeah so uh, you said that you didn't do anything about it can you say more about that um so i can say it in kind of the um what i would have done sure if i could go back in time i would have started a conversation where i said um i'm uh he here's the kind of sex that I would like and how often I would have it. I would like to have it. And, um, you know, so wh what are the answers to those questions for you? How, how often do you want to have sex and what would it be? And how, you know, just start that, start up that conversation and find out what we each wanted. And so what, what stopped you from what beginning that, stopped that conversation? Uh, imagination. It didn't occur to me that it was an okay question or um, conversation to start. So I suppose to some extent, shame, maybe just because that's sort of my well, go-to I mean, explanation of why well, I don't I do mean, things related to sex. But. And I mean, I talk to people every single day. I talk to at least a few people who recognize that shame is playing some role in right. them not saying, not talking about with ease. But I think to narrow it down further, the idea that I was supposed to already know how everything was supposed to work. And so having the conversation and starting the conversation would be somehow admitting that I was not right. Mm. Um, that I was um substandard weird well, so, yeah. I, those kinds of things so i'm hearing some real protective like protecting that part of you that ego part that needed to believe that you were 
good just the way you were. Yes, uh, d doing that. And here's one more thing that just occurred to me also. If I had started that conversation and her answer was, well, I just don't want to have sex with you. Oh. I protected myself from that answer too. Oh, yeah. And okay. honestly, now that I've thought about that, I can't imagine it got much further than that. Yeah, um, you know, Occam's razor would suggest it would suggest that, that it was just that I didn't so, want to hear. Well, no, you. <laughs> I'm going to back you up on that and say absolutely because there were. So I was in a, a my first marriage. I did not have all the sex I wanted to have, and I happened to be the the higher drive human in that scenario, and um, it was. It did not go the same way. I did. I was a squeaky wheel. I was right, very, you were, I you... was always bringing it up. And part of why is because it never occurred to me. I have never thought I was a good person. I have never thought I was, <laughs> that is just not my jam. I do not, I do, yeah, no. So I'm, are you saying that you didn't have that part of your ego to protect? I, I wasn't trying to protect uh -huh. myself uh -huh. in that way. I, if, if it was about him not wanting me or, or wanting or thinking I couldn't do something. I was ready to hear that. Um, I just mm. desperately wanted to know why and what we could do to change it. Oh, yeah. I thought if I knew why, in fact, I went at it from a why. Tell me why and we'll find a solution. Mm. Um, I never got the why. Although, you know, years later, I look back and I'm like, oh, we weren't a good match. And there are a bunch of reasons, some of them very personal and they have entirely to do with him. And some of them being, yeah, I like we just weren't a good match. But you um, but we were good matches in other ways. You to your previous partner, me to mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in this way, we didn't line up the sexless marriage when it is a silent agreement yeah so that's the thing the result of not ever exposing myself to the possibility of being rejected meant i never got myself into a spot of being able to ask for what i wanted or to work and collaborate with her to make something that was going to work well for both of us because there's the thing creative monogamy is that's a real thing you could have, so you had a, a non-monogamous arrangement, yeah. but you weren't having any sexual um, Not at all. contact at all outside mm -hmm. of your marriage. And you also weren't having it inside your marriage, but you did have a sex life. I did. Well, I had a solo sex life. Right. Um, I, when I came to know you, uh, quite a vital one. <laughs> a vital and prodigious solo sex life. I was like, life. wow, I was impressed. I was very impressed with the, um, with the uh, intentionality and, and, um, yeah, just like you were fully engaged. Masturbation was fun for you and it didn't seem, and I know that we talked about shame around wasn't... it, but, but I also was just impressed that you were very present for yourself in that way. So yay. And yet you weren't experiencing the partnered sex right. that you longed for. What do you think? What do you think you could have done for yourself? Not with your partner, not like, okay. not because we'll, we never, we'll never know. We have no idea what our partners really will do. Yep. What could you have done for yourself to allow yourself to bring that into awareness, to let yourself see it for what it was? Well, I, going back to, I would have had to expose myself to the, potential of rejection i would have had to well i i had to imagine that things could be different like very first well, step first. i had to imagine that it was possible to change but that part of the modern monogamous viewpoint had me saying well i'm married so this is the situation i am in as though married had its own shape and structure, like it was a house I was in that I couldn't add, make any additions to. Yeah, we hear that actually quite a bit. So people know or we an talk apartment about... building <laughs> with a <laughs> landlord. Mm, okay. Anyway. Well, we hear this. We hear about um, people. The, the imagination of marriage. We talk about love and relationships and sex. So people come to us and yep. just talk about it in casual settings as well. And something I've noticed lately is that. There is very clearly an imagination of marriage um, that that distinctly defines for many people what they think they should have. 
Oh, yes. And it, it, it bears no relationship to any, like, I, there is no, there's no book. There's no set of rules. It's like raising a kid. There's, if anything, at best, we've got a library's worth of different versions of the rules. Yeah. Yeah. There is no generic, hey, here's the right way and right amount and right all. There isn't. But wow, we come up with this idea of a normal amount of sex, yeah. a regular amount. I, In fact, I hear this all the time um, when I'm dating. I'll, I'll ask people questions about their, their like, what do they want? And uh, the number of people, in particular cisgender men, who reply to me, uh, oh, just the normal amount of sex. <laughs> just, just, just the regular. I just, I just What's like regular that? sex, and I'm like, well, do you mean regular, like on a schedule? I, I have regular seven o'clock sex. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know yes. what that means. So, that imagination of what being married would be like, it came with some assumptions about sex specifically, right? Yes. When you got married, what did you think was going to happen? Um. Well, I thought we'd have sex on the wedding night. Did you? Well, no. Weddings are exhausting. They really are. <laughs> They're really tiring. They really so, are. no, we did not. You and I um, managed. We did. Yeah. But that's another story altogether. But uh, I but... am old and spry now. <laughs> you are spry. I'm spry. Um, but what did you think was going to happen i mean i definitely thought in the in the like in the sense of how sex was going to go yeah. day to day as part of the marriage i well i thought it would continue the same way it was uh and here's something that so specific to my experience we'd had a long distance relationship for years which meant that i saw her on most weekends and that was it then we moved in together and we had sex at about the same frequency as we did when we were far apart. Mm -hmm. Then we got married and so we had a lot of discussions about marriage and trying not like trying to find ways that the marriage wouldn't define our relationship, but it was something we were doing with you it. Were iconoclastic. So we you were trying, to yeah. So we were trying to keep our relationship the way it was, which included the sex, although not explicitly. Um, but uh, we didn't start having sex more. And I don't remember that we started having sex less right away, except we did because there was the night of the wedding and then we had sex. But then we went on a trip for the honeymoon and then we weren't having as much sex. Um, and honest to God, knowing you the way I do, you were in a hotel and you didn't have sex. How is that even possible? Were you like chained to a wall? Uh, I like think in a bad part way? of me might have been. Yeah, in a bad way. So I don't know how you stop so yourself. I've seen you in I hotels. do like hotels. So I do like hotel sex. I think there's, what I'm hearing is something that I, I hear a lot. Um, an, an unawareness, a, an, a, dis, a, dis, a detachment between... Yeah what is the concrete details yep. just like the data of what's happening and your your um the inner image that you've made of what's happening so, your inner explanation of what's happening so a simple way of saying that is the fantasy world that I was living in and the actual data of the life that was around me yeah. they did not line up at all yeah and you had an yeah. interesting experience of um, I mean, celibacy was suggested to you, correct? Early, very early on. Um, she asked what I thought about celibacy. I mean, we recently had an episode about approaching your partner about non-monogamy. Um, I recommend a similar, you know, care in <laughs> approaching your partner yeah, with celibacy if you're already in a sexual relationship. Yeah. Um, and we were. And so, yeah, it came up and I did not. I chose not to factor that in. So you didn't read anything into I it. I didn't read anything into it. And I, it, it seems like I And dismissed should've. the idea as yeah. if. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so. Well, I also, I took it as an, an, a curiosity. Like an intellectual. And I answered it for curiosity. myself and dropped it. And I didn't. So you didn't think about 
Why would someone bring that up? I did not. I did not do why the critical thinking. They? I did not do the higher level thinking of, uh, yeah, why might someone start So you're, in hindsight, I'm sure you look back and you're like, oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. I certainly do. Oh. And the thing is, it doesn't really matter whether that's true or not. The clue was still there that there was yeah. some, there was a discussion that could be had that mm -hmm. might lead to something different, something new. So fast forward, you're living in a sexless marriage. Um, you've had your first child. You, you went through infertility. Yes. Yep. Um, that's a big deal all by itself. Sex and fertility are, uh, talk about an underexplored topic. And if mm. you're interested in, in, um, sex after infertility, especially when you wind up without children, go follow the pleasure anarchist on Instagram immediately. Um, she has Katie J young has some amazing things to say about that. So I will put that in the show notes. Amazing stuff. But you experienced infertility for quite some time. You were trying to have a child for like eight years, I think, yeah. before you finally did IVF and got a baby. Maybe six. I, it's hard yeah. to remember. A while. So. Uh, not eight. Yeah, I think it's six. Okay. And did anybody ask? So you went there. Thereby the hangs a tale. So, um, so it's not just the two of you who didn't have a discussion about sex. That's right. But you went through infertility. Now, babies tend to still be made in a an old-fashioned manner by, like, wherein um, sperm... A lot of them are ...is made. deposited into the vaginal canal, and then pregnancy occurs inside a uterus. And one of the ways that can happen is with the penis and vagina sex. That you were looking forward to I so much. I was looking forward to. Um, so... I mean, I, I, I think <laughs> listeners, I think you might be able to put this together. So you've got people who aren't having sex very often and they're having trouble getting pregnant. And by not very often, you mean like a few times a year. Yeah. Yeah. A few, maybe, you know, maybe a dozen. Okay. And not well-timed or anything. That, that, no, no. Um, so then we went to the fertility doctor and she asked many questions. None of them were, so what kind of sex do you have just off the top of my head? Like, yeah, because there are things you can do like. that don't actually produce babies. Yeah, there's there's some stories. About um, that. So, yeah, they, they did Nobody not address asked. that Nobody asked issue at all. What actions you were taking, nope. what positions you were in, nope. what, um, how frequent, what time of the month, what you were... None of right. that. So, um, and so this six is six years. But if you had this is sex, late in the twentieth century. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> imagine though. Imagine though that you're you're um, a cisgender couple, heterosexual couple, having sex, but you've only had sex fifty times and you haven't gotten pregnant. Mm -hmm. That's not actually. That's not wild. That's not no. a like. Because one of the things I'm thinking about is the the hit to your own sense of self that you took over all of the infertility struggles. And I don't know what her, what the hit to her sense of identity and self was, but there there was something there and nobody addressed this very reasonable thing. So what's up with your sex life? Right. How does it go? Let's talk about it. Yep. Um, that, that feels huge to me, but it also feels like an, an a part of the silent agreement that was just sort of um, under eroding yeah. the connection that you might have had, because there probably were some difficult conversations to have about infertility too. I yes. would imagine. Yeah. I don't know how that. I didn't and struggle with that. I, I was I was right. very lucky and didn't struggle with it, so I don't know. But our um, our relationship in my first marriage was characterized by not talking about much that was, well, nothing psychological, but uh, nothing particularly um, practical either. Mm -hmm. um, not about the relationship. Nothing personal. <laughs> yeah, we would talk about the house and, you know, how to get the pool working. And um, so you mentioned the silent agreement. 
And because we never talked about the personal psychological things, we couldn't have had a discussion that led to um, a shared agreement. So instead we had to guess and assume and think we knew what the other person was agreeing to. Yeah. And so it's pretty easy for that to lead to no sex. Um, because it just never came, it never got talked about. And that's the kind of thing that can really compound. I, my experience of not having sex was not having as much sex as I wanted to was that um, I started to feel bad about myself and it took, I had to continually like shore up my, my sense of self-worth mm -hmm. and my, and my love of my body. It was, it was an uphill slog against feeling unwanted, feeling rejected within marriage. And my own picture of marriage was I got married. Part of the reason I got married was because I wanted sex. I wanted, I wanted to have mm -hmm. sex. And that was the image. That, so I was raised in a household with two parents who did have sex frequently. And I did like, I knew about it. It was a, it was a normal thing. It was very normalized in my household. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a big deal. Um, but I knew that my parents had sex and enjoyed each other. Like they would make out on my couch when I owned a house. It was, you know, they were like that. <laughs> like we're going to annoy our like children. How we're going to annoy our children. Um, Perfect. Not in a gross way, just in a way that's gross, you know. Yeah, gross for them, their children. Yeah, but I, I thought that that's what I would get, and when I didn't, it, it was. I felt so rejected that then it became this, um, this power struggle. So we were very verbal about how sexlessness went in our in our marriage and I don't want to I don't want to overstate it we went up to six months without having sex but it wasn't on order of years mm -hmm. um but it did get weaponized it was a way that we definitely um I was engaging in uh, self-destructive behavior because I would feel like my self-worth would just like fall out from under me and and then I would I would spend so much energy trying to get this thing from him that I would forget to turn toward my own pleasure. Not forget to masturbate. Yeah. I didn't forget about that. But I would forget to turn toward like deep embodied pleasure. And and we did. We stopped connecting over it. And it started to be this, this um, bomb sort of sitting there in the middle of us. And eventually I would, I would you know, I would feel like I had to sort of like, like unlock this box and mm. figure out exactly the thing. And then I could have sex. And, and I wonder if I had had a similar temperament to you, if I would have continued trying to open the box, never stop fiddling, but I eventually stopped trying and the th to, to my discredit, um, I never even tried the simple, um, Act the voice of activation. Looking, a voice <laughs> activation, yes. So how does this box open? How how do things work for you? Just like I feel pretty bad about it now, not ever having given her the opportunity to respond. Um, just for yeah. again, from my own point of view, that was something I didn't do. And I would like to be able to say that I did so that I could know as much as I could have known about her, but I didn't. And and it led to, yeah, these, these silent, implicit agreements about all kinds of things. So my golden rule is make it explicit. Yes. I'm what, what's on board. It? Everything. Just, let's just make it all explicit. Let's get it mm -hmm. all out there. And it takes immense fortitude. I don't actually think that it takes courage, but I do think it takes fortitude because you have to just keep bringing out there's always more. There's always new. Yeah. So it, you're going to have to last. You know, there's going to have to be this this intention of continually being willing to face what's actually going on. Yes. And how it's working for you. And you can do that from a from a non judgmental stance. Mm -hmm. You like you could judge it as I don't like this for me, yep. but <laughs> but that doesn't mean that you're not saying well. I don't, I don't like this. This isn't working for me. And that's where I feel like I, I feel like I was in integrity with myself because I continued to ask for the things that I wanted. I didn't get them. And that mm -hmm. led to quite a lot of heartbreak, but I see it and I feel it so differently from you who describes this like, Oh, I don't, I didn't even 
I didn't show up for myself. I didn't show up for myself. Mm -hmm. And ask for what I wanted. There are a lot of hard conversations to have in life. Things never get better by not having them. That's right. So I just want to encourage everyone to get out there and have the messy conversations that need to be had. Engage with the help that you need to have those conversations. It's never too late. Yes. So. Just keep talking to each other. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to jolie at joliehamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the entrepreneur's action plan for passionate, sustainable love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news. <laughs>